Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Waking Up in Daily Life, Conversations on Creativity, Consciousness, and Community. I'm your host, Albert Flynn de Silver, and I'm so glad you're here. And um, I wish to begin by just reminding you the best way to support this whole um, program is really to just simply to like this video if you do in fact. Um, we're open to constructive comments um, and uh, constructive compassionate comments and uh, if you like and if you subscribe that really helps us. Um, we are a free uh, interview and um, that would really help us support these incredible conversations that I have with writers, artists, and uh, creative, all kinds of creative people. So welcome once again. And uh, today I am super excited to be talking to Wa Win. And um, I, I double checked to make sure that I was pronouncing her beautiful name correctly. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but Wa is uh, the author of several books of poems, uh, including most recently what we'll talk about today, uh, A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure, which is just an absolutely gorgeous book from Wave Books. Um, and she is the winner of a million awards, including um, the Canadian Book Award, uh, and a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award, the National Book Award, Governor's General Award, um, Griffin Prize nominations, Pushkar Prize nominations, and a whole bunch of others. Welcome, Wa, and I'm so happy to talk with you. So nice to be here. Well, let's begin at the beginning somewhat. I'm, I'm so curious. Um, I just loved reading this book and about your mom and, uh, your kind of origin story, as it were. But I'm curious about your origin story uh, in terms of poetry and where that began for you. Um, was this something that you grew up with um, in your, your household as a child or, or what, what drew you into this um, just wonderful commitment to poetry? Yeah, I think I've always been interested in language as it encounters music, encounters song. And so my first sort of formation of the power of language in that of relationship is through music. Um, you know, when I was at my mother, when we immigrated from um, Vietnam to the US, my mother brought with her like a prized possession at the time, uh, this would have been the late 60s. Um, a reel to reel, which had, um, so, and she had these cassette tapes, or not cassette tapes, they were uh, those, those reel to reel tapes. Um, and so they were um, Vietnamese folk music and some pop music, and um, Johnny Cash uh, were, the, were the, the discs that she had, or, or these reels that she had. And so the, by the time I was like a, in elementary school, I could figure it out how to play these uh, tapes, and it was, um, listening, I think it's particularly in the language I understood, which was English, <clears throat> we were not a bilingual household growing up. <clears throat> um, the songs and the stories that could be held inside of song, um, but then it, it, the story's relationship um, remains an expression in lyric poetry, in the poetry that that is uh, deeply uh, rooted in um, you know, these, these vocalizations that are beyond language. So anyway, so I think there is, is, is a, a source. Uh, I've always been drawn uh, to poetry and storytelling, but always poetry. Um, and then again, you know, in my public library, we didn't have, uh, you know, we weren't a, a book rich household. Um, school, I, I excelled in school. It, it was a, definitely a place where, uh, uh, you know, I was a, my 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 readerliness was appreciated, and I was encouraged to go to the library by my family, and so I would check out you know as many books as I can, and I would turn to the poetry section, um, and I discovered um, a book, an anthology of um, poems translated um, from Vietnamese into English. Um, it was um, one of the one of the English translators is poet um, Merwin, right? Um, mm -hmm. Merwin, I didn't know who that was at the time. Um, the Vietnamese um, uh, translator was um, Win Vic um, Do, I think. 
And um, anyway, the, the first sentence in the introduction was something like, um, the Vietnamese uh, people believe they have always been poets. And so mm. I took that <laughs> as like a kind of, uh, kind of um, possession that I had already you know, had, um, which was important to me as someone who felt actually quite dispossessed of country and language and culture, mm -hmm. uh, prim primarily uh, growing up in a pretty you know, a white homogenous um, place in uh, Maryland and uh, just outside the beltway of uh, Washington DC. Mm. Um, and, and again, and, and also I'm, I'm mixed. So, so there's, there's a, the, I think that place of betweenness or association between languages. So between song and poetry, between storytelling and um, singing, mm -hmm. uh, between a Vietnamese folk songs and Johnny Cash, you know, the, those, yeah, yeah. those places of meetings um, were important for me. That's beautiful. Well, and that it's so well reflected in the, the poetry itself, which which I want to talk about in a second. But I'm also curious as to uh, sort of moving up through your maybe high school years or into college, when were you like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this. Like I can do this. Like what was that turning point where you felt a sense of possibility? Um, yeah, as an undergrad, uh... You know, I, I so I did end up going. You know, going beyond high school, I went first to community college um, because I didn't really have a pathway um, for me. Uh, it's cheaper. I could figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to earn a, a certificate in early childhood education. Actually, first I thought I could um, work for myself and um, open my own preschool. I liked, I knew I liked little mm -hmm. kids and I knew I liked uh, teacherliness, you know, to, to be in those sort of spaces. Um, but then uh, as I started working, so I was working full time and going to school at night uh, as one does. And um, I realized, oh, this is exhausting work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, not, not well paid. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, it, rewarding uh, and fun, uh, but uh, but not well paid. So I decided to go to the University of Maryland, which is uh, you know where my local uh, state institution, um, and I studied psychology actually because mm. um, I wanted to like I think sort through my own sort of psychology. You know, mm -hmm. um, you might you can probably imagine. Um, having narrated, you know, some things about my upbringing, you know, we we immigrated from Vietnam at the height of the war. There was mm -hmm. lots of challenges inside of then growing up in the shadow of that war, mm -hmm. also, um, and in a, in a white context too, in a time when um, the language to talk about difference really is, was in circulation in the same way it is now. Um, lots of anti-Asian sentiment, anti-Vietnamese sentiment, mm. um, you know, and the narratives around Vietnam are always centering uh, the war and white Americans, mostly, you know, and, and the, mm. you know, and that's the perspective. Uh, so it was confusing, you know. Um, it, so I, I think that was partly motivating my wanting to study psychology, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I yeah. thought, okay, then I might be like a social worker, mm -hmm. and maybe I can work with kids and do art therapy. That was like that was the other idea. So I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Work, make more money. I'll have a license. Yeah, and then I'll write poetry on the side. So the whole mm -hmm. time I was still like writing my heart out, you know, uh, poorly, badly, not well informed, but um, with a lot of um, seriousness. Mm -hmm. and ambition and you know I, I was I, again I was a readerly type and so I would memorize poems that um, meant something to me and could, you know recite them to myself uh, really a, I'm deeply a romantic uh, obviously mm -hmm. um, but anyway so uh, it wasn't until uh, I didn't get didn't really sort of understand the significance it took a little it took a, it took a few years when I was at the University of Maryland I started taking um, I took like, I did an English minor. So mm -hmm. I, I, I took, uh, I started, I, I saw that there was something you could take called creative writing. Yeah, right. A workshop. I was mm -hmm. like, what? what is this fantasy place? And mm -hmm. that, and that, I mean, 
that's when I was completely alive, right? And I and and, and so when I, I finished, got my degree in psychology, and so I went on to take like an intermediate poetry workshop class, which I had to like petition to get into mm-hmm. as a non a non English major, um, and was then remembered decades later by that p- professor that I petitioned to get into that class, uh, uh, which was this whole full circle moment um, just a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. But um, so, so what, after I graduated and I was getting ready to apply for so- social work uh, school, master's in social work school, um, I had one of those, you know, um, uh, brushes, not brushes with death, um, experiences of loss, a uh, mm. co-worker um, died in a car crash. Wow. You know, she was in mm. her early 20s. I was at this point, 24. And, you know, it just is one of those things where you realize, oh yes, life is young, All, uh, you know, life, life is super short. Uh, but also, um, so it was a calamity at this full-time restaurant. I worked at a restaurant at this point, uh, full-time in between school, trying to figure out what I was gonna do. Debbie, uh, what's her name, uh, died. It was right near Christmas. Mm. Um, everyone was devastated, you know, her friend group, uh, her family, obviously. So the community came out uh, to uh, her services, her funeral. And, um, I stepped forward to, 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 to deliver a eulogy. Hmm. So, um, so it was like myself and like her uncle that could like kind of volunteer to, to do it. Yeah. Uh, so the uncle went first uh, and then, and then I stood up and, and I delivered mine and, and I sat down and I, I recognized, I think in the, in, after reflection, um, the, the ability for language, like the, what language can do uh, in, uh, in occasion, uh, with community, um, th- that, that, that's activated in a particular way. Uh, anyway, so those two, those two, those two events sort of, um, collaborated to allow me to recognize, like I needed to follow that, uh, ignition that I felt in that creative writing workshop, mm-hmm. um, where I felt completely, uh, activated. Um, mm. to, to go towards that, to not go to this safe idea that I could be a social worker right. um, and uh, write poems uh, as, a, as, a, as a side, as a side thing. I had to de- devote. Yeah, know. yeah. Well, that, that's beautiful. And, you know, you think about the role of poetry in our culture, um, which is very peripheral and marginalized, right? And, but it tends to show up in, you know, in occasions, funerals, weddings, um, uh, transitions, all these, these, you know, essentials. That no, and it doesn't really matter if people are interested in poetry or have poetry in their life. It's just like, oh, this thing's happening, poem, <laughs> you know? And I've always found that so curious in our culture where it's, you know, in other cultures, and I don't know if this is true in, in Vietnam, but it sounds like it is, that it's much more integrated as part of the ongoing dialogue and part of the ongoing culture at large. Um, well, yeah, well, the irony is, is that, you know, as I, you know, I was really separated from like a kind of Vietnamese culture and my, and my mother, frankly, also was, I mean, her, her separation also had to do with, um, you know, uh, French, uh, French uh, colonization of Vietnam and her, her sort of young life being very affected by, by that and, and civil, um, civil war, you know, so, it, uh, so there, there was a lot of like uh, reasons for like, there were actually lots of uh, rupture, including also that my mother was, um, you know, understood that within um, the structures of, of, of how she, she was raised and, and as, a, as, a, as a poor uh, girl, uh, that she wouldn't have a lot of options, you know. Yeah. So she she left home very early, and mm-hmm. and sought this very different uh, kind of life that was uh, really wayward, actually, like culturally wayward. So, mm-hmm. um, so, so I had a kind of unique uh, diaspora Vietnamese immigrant experience. You typically <clears throat> the 
um, the experience is like discourage all arts, you know, only become something mm. that we can make money mm. because of the, the very real like socioeconomic realities. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Right? And so um, I, I, I really think it's, it's my mother's um, sort of rebellious, um, you know, uh, youthful waywardness that gave me a sense of permission also. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but there are, but there are some cultural, um, ex there are cultural expressions of poetry um, in Vietnamese culture, including, including a very rich uh, folk poetry form, which is um, oral and, and like linked and you add, you add and collaborative, like you add your own, you update it which is very also like a kind of like ballad traditions in, in uh, North America mm -hmm. where, where a, a, a song travels and then, then it, it relocates into a region and it, it takes on different, uh, different aspects of that place and time and yeah. yeah. Well, and I wanna talk more about your mother because it's <laughs> central to the book, but um, I also kind of, I'm fascinated by this evolution um, because Next thing we know, you're um, writing poetry. You're taking it more seriously. You um, and I, you went to grad school, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And then creating zines, and and that's that's where we where I first came across your work. So can you talk about that? Like, so you go to this this um, funeral, and your friend dies, and then it's like, oh wow, game on, in a sense. Yeah, I like, um, yeah, I just I applied for a school in San Francisco because I knew, I mean, I, did, I had sort of, my motivations were like, I either go really far or I don't go far at all. Like those are the two sort of options. And actually at the time my mother had, had been recently ill. And so I was concerned about like leaving the region, but um, I'd been to San Francisco. I ordered the catalog. I was really curious about it. Was, it was not online back then also, by the way, so to, to, to date myself, um, ordered the paper catalog and looked at the course offerings um, to see sort of how they structured semesters. And it was it was a reading based uh, structure. And I, and I understood that with my background, I, I wanted to have, um, you know, this kind of this coursework that would um, provide um, context that could be part of the conversation. What was interesting is they also structured it so that uh, this is at New College of California, uh, mm -hmm. which is no longer right. uh, in in uh, San Francisco at the time, early '90s, uh, and they had just started M an MFA program, uh, and they also had a late deadline, and so I was able to apply before the deadline, and then I was like on a train uh, in August, so it was very sort of like I felt like I was meeting up with something. Uh, that was the sensation I had, and like mm -hmm. you know, moving to a city where I didn't know anybody. It was a very romantic again, <laughs> that sort of proposal. Um, and then in New and then I think part of my introduction uh, in San Francisco uh, via New College and the faculty there, they came from traditions of, you know, you you make a magazine, you publish your friends, you publish you know the people you want <laughs> that you read um, and adore. Uh, you know, and you beg for work in your tiny magazine that you mimeograph. It was very part of a kind of um, 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 poetics, really, mm -hmm. of, of engagement, of, of contributing to the conversations, mm -hmm. of making things, of also not like relying on, you know, official sources um, or institutions, like to be mobile and active. Um, mm -hmm. And within, you know, within your relationships is really about, about relationships uh, ultimately. And then, yeah, so we sort of took that with, I took that, I met my partner, Dale Smith in San Francisco and we took that with us when we moved to, to Austin, Texas uh, later in the late nineties. But, but also I was gonna say that, that the small press um, ethos is also something that I understood from, um, you know, participating in like alternative music culture of the DC area at the time, which was very mm -hmm. about a DIY sort of post-punk, you know, ethos of, um, you know, cut your own records and and swap and swap tapes between communities between other indie mm -hmm. you know, indie labels, yeah. And, yeah. and then you, you know, organize shows and promote each other's work. You know, it's it, it's uh, and then like, but also appreciate the sound and like have fights about it. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, there was very much a sense of that, of community in those days. I, you know, I came to San Francisco right around the same time you did in 93. I wound up at the Art Institute uh, studying photography or actually failing at photography. <laughs> but, you know, then Paul Hoover um, shows up with this new anthology of post postmodern American poetry. And, um, and, and, you know, Bill Bergson, he sends me off to these poetry readings where I see you and Dale and um, the Blue Books crowd um, just doing all kinds of amazing stuff at New College. And, um, and I think this is so important, you know, people don't really realize, um, especially if they're older, it's, it's um, and they're coming to poetry later in life, the importance of community and the importance of participation and engagement. Um, because otherwise, and this is a question I'm going to save for later, but <laughs> otherwise we're sort of adrift, a you know. And so I just love hearing particularly your story because it's, I mean, you're going from this sort of alternative zines and experimental poetics to, you know, the Griffin Prize and the Kingsley Tuft Award and, <laughs> and all this stuff, which is a really just fabulous transition you know, and, and sort of gives me hope in terms of like the possibilities for uh, inclusion and, and larger participation, larger conversations in, um, in terms of poetry. So I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about that, that um, sort of evolution from kind of experimental margins to more, I don't know, what would you call mainstream isn't quite the right word, but I don't know, paid larger, attention. larger audience. Yeah, paid attention to. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I think people were paying attention a lot. I think it's uh, honestly part of it is it's like if you and I said this elsewhere, it's like if you don't go away, like people have to sort of deal with you after a while. <laughs> yeah, you don't go away. <laughs> right. You know, you're showing up and and you're participating and you know, um and you know, there's there's uh relevancy and you know all, all the things it's there's it's a it's not really a formula and i, I don't recommend it actually <laughs> it's like because it's a bit of a hard row right like mm -hmm. the, oh you, you have to be outside of an institution for your whole participation and um you know literary arts making is is a is a harder place i mean I'm not, that's not 100 percent true either there's been lots of ways in which I've, I've experienced um, institutional um, privilege and um, uh, it, you know really benefited from um, associations like just like working working in a university you know like that's 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 what I mean um, but I you know like for example when I when when uh, when I lived in Austin I, I worked at the University of Texas um, as a staff member I joined actually. Um, as a as a coordinator of a of a tour um, of a of a, the fa of their famous um, tower of their clock tower, oh, okay. which, which actually I, I actually has a moment in the in a poem in this selection because the tower the towerness tower became a kind of image that that travels through across the poems, mm. um, but yeah. So the clock tower at the University of Texas Austin is like the symbol of the yes. university. But yeah. in the in the sixties, which not uh, not sort of uh, not not incidentally, I don't know. That's a double negative. I'm not sure where we end up <laughs> with that. But but I mean, um, uh, it's also happened at this at this sort of time period of that's that my book A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure is interested in. So mm -hmm. the towerness became um, sort of an apt sort of return. But just like coincidentally, that was that was my job. They reopened the the observation deck of this famous tower that's associated with this um, this this massacre by by this sniper um, named Charles Whitman in 1966 wow. um, it was the first time anything like that had happened. It was famous at the time. It was lots of footage of it. It's it's, it's horrifying. Um, and in fact, after that event, this was the invention of the SWAT team. They closed this this observation deck, but it was. Um, you know, remained, you know, sort of like this sort of shuttered, you know, space. And so they wanted to like, you know, free it from that association and mm -hmm. reopen it. They secured the, the top of it and they needed to hire somebody 
to like manage the tours and like write like the copy and um, sell the, you know, help, help the, t- the ticket desk run and everything. Oh like my God, that. so that's great. I was your person with my, my, yeah. my, my newly minted masters in fine arts. Uh, <laughs> yes. You know, and, and making Skanky Possum. Um, right. poetry zine which I which I put on my resume when I applied for that job um, oh good good yeah, good can you talk a little bit about skanky possum as a tangent <laughs> here because I, I've just s- such fond memories I, it was such a pivotal zine oh, well, of the times. You know, actually you know skanky possum came out of like a continuation of of doing zines that 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 Dale Smith my partner and partner in life um since that time um had had begun with a with a zine a one off zine that he called Dale uh, Dale's younger poets uh, no first it was Yale's younger poets after the the series as a joke but then okay. people were like you can't do that because it's too confusing <laughs> so then it was Dale's younger poets because uh, his name is Dale and it rhymes with Yale right. and then because his buddy Mike uh, was also you know, part of this cohort, it was Mike and Dale's younger poets because it also sounds like Chip and Dale's or something. And right, kind right. Of, kind of goofy. Um, and then we wanted to change it to Qua Mike and Dale's, but that that point we had moved to Austin and it was getting unwieldy. And then Mike was kind of doing his own thing in San Francisco. And then we we're like, let's just start a new magazine. So, so Skanky Possum really had been something that was part of a whole set of, you know, editorial, curatorial publishing activities. But yeah, it started at like in 97 or 97, I think was the first issue. I think Mm -hmm. we did 10 copies. Um, It seemed like a lot, that seems like a lot, but also like not a lot. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I just remember being so thrilled by it. And then um, when a poem appeared in there, I was just like, I have arrived. I have made it in the poetry world. <laughs> um, and I, can you also share a little bit about some of the spinoffs that, that came out of that? Because there was like, there was like Dale and um, Mike's like garage poetry, like cabinet. I, I There was just like so many funny um, spinoffs with um, Noel Black and um, and yeah, then- I think that, yeah, so, so the, the folks that stay, that stayed in San Francisco, I think carried on stuff, um, through Blue Press, mm-hmm. out That's right. of yeah. New College on Valencia, they had like a storefront, but that was, that was after I, I had already been gone a while. Oh, um, uh, okay. Yeah, um, that was all like later 90s, like late, late 90s, early aughts. Um, yeah. and we, we arrived in Austin in 97, Okay. Um, which okay. then was like this sleepy college town capital still, like mm-hmm. it was less under the radar than it had been when Dale, who was from there, had lived there. He'd gone there as an undergrad, um, and part of high school there. Um, you know, when Slacker was filmed, like that was right. really sleepy then. Yeah. Um, but in the late nineties, it was still really possible to like get like a university job and sort of, you know, just kind of hold down, you know, your rent and um, like kind of live. And so that yeah. was sort of the plan. And, and then we want, and then like part of living was like to have this magazine. And then of course, out of the magazine comes like people like coming through Austin, like I mean, it wasn't really on the map, but it was starting to like become sort of like people would come through mm-hmm. on their way to somewhere else. And it just ended up, we would like have enough sort of friends from our associations and activities um, coming through that we could, you know, feature feature people, um, curate a series at a, at a first at a bookstore and then just from our from our house because mm-hmm. we, we ended up at our house anyway at the end, you know. Yeah, right, and, right. <laughs> And just became easily just have we built a little stage on the side of our house um, in the later years um, to to ha- to have it you know feel more of a more of a like a of a presentation when one is reading rather than sitting in the living room because we started getting you know too many people but yeah. um yeah it was it was a, those are fun days but yeah thank you possum you know had a good run we we ended up. Um, getting kind of crushed by our own popularity by the end because it was just the two of us and it was all by hand. There was no submittable. Mm-hmm. No submittable. I know. 
stamps and paper. Yes. Well, I could reminisce about those days forever, but I want to talk about a thousand times um, you lose your treasure. And I'm hoping that you have a copy of the book there because yeah. at some point I'm going to ask if, if you would be so kind <laughs> to read. Uh, I have a, so many favorite poems, but there are a couple in particular. Um, but before we do that, I'm just sort of curious. Um, can you talk about the, that, the photograph that's at the very beginning, which is such an amazing picture. And it really, it set my kind of imagination on fire. And I sort of, and I had to refrain from going to the end and sort of figuring out like, what is this? What am I looking at? And what's the story here? Uh, so it was so fun to read through the poems and, the, and like the story kind of accumulates, um, but it's in fragments because it's poetry. So it's not, you know, we're not getting narrated from, you know, this is who she is, and this is what the, 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 the. So can you talk a little bit about that like story as fragment, as poetry? I mean, um, yeah, fragment's an interesting word. I think um, you get parts, right? There's stories and parts, stories and pieces, stories in, um, that are transmitted through like a gesture. Mm -hmm. right? It's yes. not even that it's broken or incomplete. No, no. It's that it's um, these isolations maybe that you're sort of stringing together to create like a pattern or I think sometimes I think of it like a necklace mm, um, or mosaic. You can also yeah. think of it as like yeah. pieces in a mosaic and each piece is different and irregular. Um, but together create a whole. Um, and I think too, like song lyrics, I mean, song lyrics really drift and, and you know, swerve and, um, you know, break off and uh, don't, don't have all the pieces in between. It jumps, you know, jumps ahead 10 years mm -hmm. suddenly between the bridge and, right? You know, so um, I was interested in the, in the kinds of, um, I, like the ways that poetry can, um, be compact and 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 deliver a, a presentation of experiences that aren't necessarily like fully elaborated for 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 our you know consumption you know mm -hmm. that it's also like a part of the experience is um the reception of the reader or the auditor so that uh you know that there's a certain way in which you're also collaborating with the meaning making mm -hmm. um because it because i'm also interested in like the way sound um activates like emotional correlations and um you know more connotative uh, registers mm -hmm. um that that are not free or free from but in association with meaning yeah. Well, and there's so many different uh, modalities here. We have letters, um, there's hexagrams, right? And for those of us who don't know, tell us what is a hexagram? Well, um, yeah, I mean, there's a hexagram uh, reference in here. So hexagram is um is how you describe the the drawing one makes from um throwing your hexagram which is six uh six lines either dashed or solid um that you draw literally um based on the combinations of heads or tails that appear when you throw three coins uh six times mm -hmm. um then after you after you figure out you know the configuration of of uh, solid to broken lines based on the throws of your coins. You look at the drawing in this book called the I Ching, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very old book. Um, and it's a book that I had a long relationship with like since my teenage years. So going back to sort of you know, sort of the beginnings of like where, why poetry and the I Ching is this, this, this oracular text. Um, kind of mysterious and you know the translation I had was Wilhelm's tr translation so a uh, German translator famously this edition introduced by Carl Jung the the you know the 
the translation doesn't give the cultural context. So it's, it's a little mm -hmm. bit, feels a little esoteric, like the fox will cross the creek, you know, or something, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and yeah. won't get its feet wet. And you're like, what? Okay. But evocative, right? And fall also felt like poetry. Um, and, you know, was kind of cryptic and interesting and also Asian. And I was interested in like trying to connect, you know, to uh, what does it mean to be an Asian diasporic person? Like, what is this text that seemed clearly really important? What is oracular? Like, why is this the sage? Like those things really. And then I had, mm -hmm. I had encountered the Tao Te Ching early on in Buddhism, which I didn't grow up with uh, culturally, but it was something that I, you know, looked out for and, um, responded to and, and, and carried on in my own sort of private, private way um, in thinking. Um, but yeah, the, the forms are, the forms are very various. Um, the hexagram 51, Chen, thunder over thunder, or thunder on top of thunder, um, shock is the fortune, right? Chaos. Mm -hmm. um, mm. I can't remember the exact, I can't remember the exact word. It's like thunder over thunder, generative chaos. No, that's now, now I'm confusing with the tower. Because, but what's interesting is that the hexagram Chen is a lot like the tower card from the tarot, mm. which also then becomes an emblem, or as I said, like this image across the, the sequence. But when I got the hexagram, um, I, I was embarking to write A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure. Uh, I was consulting the I Ching because I was sort of at a loss. I knew I wanted to write about my mother's life, right. which, you know, in, in uh, you know, st started in, in this, you know, small village farm, um, being raised by traditional grandparents, leaving home at 15 to join a circus, become a celebrated stunt motorcyclist. And then, you know, and the end that part of her life and then be, was a merchant, you know, which is sort of this undescribed sort of period of time and met the, the person she were, was to marry, also had me met, met the person she was to marry and then left that, you know, during her Saturn return when she was like 27, left Vietnam and never went back. Wow. Uh, in the late 60s at the height of the American War in Vietnam. So it became so when I saw when I saw that I drew thunder over thunder when I saw that the that the fortune right which is like the what the sage says about like what you should know is that I needed to think about um, about cal calamity I need to think about mm. like thunderous um, mm -hmm. forces and um, and it was something it was a difficult. Uh, thing for me to uh, reflect on in a, in a certain way because I and uh, one of my, one of my outlooks was that I, I absolutely did not want to feature the American War mm. as the narrative mm. of this book because mm -hmm. that it's not that's not this book that's every other narrative you know that that I have available to me in English you know about mm -hmm. Vietnam we say yeah. Vietnam they don't mean the country or people or anything like that they mean a war right, and they right, mean specifically. Right. Americans in the war. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and mostly men. Um, and mm -hmm. so, and so I, uh, I had a hard time thinking about that hexagram, but I understood that I really had to um, think about the effects of shock, and also what is the, what is the adaptation, uh, which right. is like to mutate, to transform. Uh, is is the adaptation in the event of like chaos and shock, right? mm. and so mm -hmm. um, which helped me as a as a kind of um, poetics, um, and and wanting the space too to like be able to absorb these different forms that you noted, like having like transcriptions of a letter, um, a partial transcription of a newspaper article. Um, a full transcription of a newspaper article, but with like, you know, there was like little missing pieces um, to understand um, that part of the, part of um, the pieciness is wholeness. Mm. Well, perfect uh, <laughs> transition into this other question, which is kind of silly and kind of not, because I think it's instructive for especially new writers, but, um, why, besides the fact that you're a poet, why poetry and not narrative, some sort of narrative form like a memoir or even a novel, uh, if you're sort of telling the story of your mother? 
in a way. Yeah, no, I mean, it's valid. Um, and I, I never ever wanted to tell her story as a memoir. I never wanted to tell it as an essay uh, or as, as a screenplay. Um, I, I, res I resisted that for, for several reasons. I think, um, you know, I would have to invent a lot of things. And mm -hmm. um, I, it was something I wasn't feeling comfortable doing. I was mm -hmm. wondering what to what purpose, like uh, I wasn't interested in, um, you know, uh, my mother's life is spectacle uh, for other for others consumption necessarily, you know, mm. like, like, uh, so, so there's a kind of ethics, I think, uh, in terms of my interests, like I just, just didn't interest me. Yeah. yeah. Um, doing that. Um, I wanted it to have its own integrity as um, something that I can't understand or that I can't really narrate um, because that, yes. that felt that felt like the right gesture. So there's an element of impossibility in terms of telling, well, first someone else's story, but any human story really in like as, as if it were a totality. Yeah, I wanted to retain that difficulty somehow. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's part of like the fabric, but not sacrifice the intimacy, right? That's that is the hope. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you've achieved it. And so, as an example, would you be willing to read Shock Fate Hexagram Fifty One? Yes, gladly. I actually don't get to read that one very often. Um, I think this was actually an earlier poem. Hmm. Um, so I I actually I I would um, read that poem. Um, a lot when I first started writing this and I first started writing towards a thousand times you lose your treasure in 2012 actually wow so this has been a project that's been going on because the book was published in 2021 yeah right. yeah I turned in the final manuscript um like Mar March or like the final 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 proofs um were were okay in March of 2020 um, okay. But yeah, I pretty much finished it before before the pandemic. Um, but Make yeah, note, so, people, that's nine years. Yeah. <laughs> nine years. Well, there was there was a big gap in between where I didn't do any work on it. But this right, was sure. this poem was was one of the first in the in the first group of poems, and then I had to let them. But I had to let them sit for a while. Mm. Um, and but I'd love to talk about that because I think that is some really important. I, I had to let it sit, and then I actually wrote Violet Energy Ingots, which is a different group of poems. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple of poems in that group now that I look look at, and I think, oh, I think I was, um, you know, practicing towards this this group of poems for a thousand times you lose your treasure, mm -hmm. um, as I was writing Violet Energy Ingots, Shock Fate Hexagram Fifty One. She mistook the munition blast for fireworks. She said goodbye to her lover. She threw the photographs into the canal. She dressed as an old woman. She shaved my head, my hair too light from the white father. She took off her jewelry. She took in neighbors, but not by choice. She could have been labeled a counter revolutionary and dumped into a mass grave. She could have said that I wasn't her baby. Vin Long Tet, 1968. That's baby me in that. In that, uh, I think it's the only one that that actually has ba that has baby. Well, actually, no. There's a couple baby me's in here. <laughs> but that's it's so so powerful. Like that, all of the fate is in there. Mm. You know, she could. All these things could have happened, especially in a time of war and uh, colonial chaos. Uh, it's kind of just, it, it brings, to me, it brings sort of the miracle of you <laughs> alive, you know, as yeah. an existence. Truly. So. Yeah, so. it was close. I, I um, well, I, you know, I was reading about this later and then I, I reflected, oh, oh, right, this plays out. Um, they say that that the it's the after effects of a big um, military assault that are the hardest on on the civilian population because you you the aftermath is of like lack of all um, access to like uh, quality clean uh, water uh, food mm -hmm. and so I actually right after the Tet Offensive. I got I got really ill and I nearly died because of because of this this after effect and but anyway that's but but truly yeah 
<laughs> a truly Chen uh, 51 shock fate. Amazing. Thank you for, for reading that. And I also want to talk about, I mean, you have so much um, sort of incredible freedom to, to integrate like the possibilities in poetry. And I think a lot of people forget that. Like they think of poetry, especially if you're a new writer, it's like poetry has to be this. It has to be in a form. It has to be blah, blah, blah. And um, you know, what, what this work really reminds me and and I'm imagining lots of other people is that, wow, anything's possible. And so you have notes as poem. So can you talk about that? Like the notes, like there's the, the notes for, well, both note and recipe. And in, in, in one case is recipe for, for napalm. I think it is. Um, no, I, there is a napalm notes. That's uh, kind of how I read it. Mm -hmm. um there's an napalm notes poem there's also like a herbicide herbicidal rainbow oh what there's an, rainbow yeah, notes herbicide. on operation hades yeah yeah um yeah i i um i mean i chose i chose those those, those are forms you know like notes you can they're sort of catalogy mm -hmm. um, they, they have a, a kind of formal distancing tone and right. so for me they were um ways to contain um, you know, data that also is charged, right? Yes. Like, yeah. Uh, and so, so for me, thinking about form was thinking about sort of the referent, uh, thinking about what it does tonally for um, language. You know, how does mm -hmm. it contain it? How does it reflect on it? Um, and you know, it, it's and it's something that I do. I do like a good note, like I have in my earlier works. And um, I think Violet Energy Ingots. There's like a um, a, a, a tree walk note. You know, you know, based on like local trees and commentary about trees, which as it accumulates, I mean, it's like, it's a very old sort of form. Really, it's kind of a mm. list poem. Yes, um, yes. It becomes a sort of a catalog or accumulation of of kinds, right? And so. Um, you know, so it's something that I that I think I probably most admire in Shay Shonigan, who you know is a thousand, was writing a thousand years ago in in uh, mm. Japan. Mm -hmm. um, Shay Shonigan, um, the poet that uh, Joanne Kiger introduced me to. Oh wow! Yes, I love Joanne. I miss her so much. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, well. Um, speaking of associations in Japan. I read um, one line, I'm just pulling this out. Of, I can't remember exactly which poem it was, but warm rain while naked. Mm -hmm. And I just immediately thought like Basho, naked on a naked horse in pouring rain. Nice. And I don't know if there was any haiku influence or, or other poetries from, from Asia that were influencing you in the, in the process of this work. Well, um... Actually, one of my one of the one of the classes in my coursework um, that I really really loved, but I I sort of mistakenly thought we were we, there was going to be more writing involved was the study of classic uh, Chinese poetry. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't. We, it was wasn't. It was fully Chinese though. It wasn't Japanese. It was like, very focused. Um, but it was a lot of like talking about like the theories of like balancing and stuff like that. And I wasn't very interested in any of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think like a lot of like Anglophones, you know, I'm, I, I don't speak other languages besides English. Um, you know, I'm introduced through translations and I definitely was drawn to um, Asian philosophy, Asian poetry that I could find that I could encounter, mm -hmm. anthologized, um, people handing me things. Um, that line, you know, is really, um, it's a poetic line, right? A warm rain. It's really slow because of the delivery of those two words together. Mm -hmm. um, and um, while naked, I mean, it's also, it's um, a, a, a remembrance my mother shared with, uh, with me. You know, she said, as a child, you know, you, you didn't, you ran around without clothes. Uh, it was, it was hot. And, mm -hmm. and, right. and, you know, and she just said, I had really, amazing memories of like raining, like just warm, like rain, yeah. tropical rain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, like, you know, it's like, and you know, they're also poor. It's like, and then you get shoes when you're like eight, 
<laughs> you know, they like didn't have electricity, the, yeah. the plumbing, and it was very, you know, different, different sort of upbringing, elemental, and so that um, was trying to transmit something about that. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, and I want to talk also about the um, the tones. You mentioned a little bit about tones, but how tones operate in in Vietnamese language. And you say you don't speak, but there's obviously some investigation as to the language because of that, that wonderful poem that has the multiple ma's. And what's interesting to me was that the, none of the equivalents as it were, I don't know if these were definitions per se of the tones, but um, none of them spoke directly to mother, which when we think of ma as a, as a voiced gesture in um, European languages, it, I associate it with the mother. So can oh, you talk no, about that piece? Well, no, it, it is associated with mother. Um, it's the final. It's oh, did I totally miss that? The second, the second ma. <laughs> now I'm embarrassed. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, so there's six different ways to pronounce the syllable ma um, in Vietnamese, a language I don't speak. And mm. so, and, you know, as, as that, that poem um, hexagram, uh, shock fate poem um, narrates I was born there um, I left as a toddler mm -hmm. um, they say though and they say that language acquisition um, happens actually starts in utero mm -hmm. right um, and then continues um, very intensely up until you're two and then by the time you're two you actually have like the entire grammar you just don't have the fine motor skills to say all the words and so when I hear Vietnamese, even though I can't speak it, because I was never then uh, acculturated with Vietnamese after we immigrated, my mother dropped Vietnamese, her, her husband didn't speak Vietnamese, my father didn't speak Vietnamese mm -hmm. um, very well. He says he did, but, you know, he, I think he spoke it, you know, enough and she spoke better English. And so they communicated in English. <laughs> um, so, uh, but that when I when I hear it, I really feel it, and I mm. and I and I do feel like um, my draw to poetry to circle back to your very first question um, actually also has to do with the tones that um, I can't say, but I can feel, mm -hmm. and my only language is English, and so that I'm when I'm writing that I'm. I'm using it as like a like a tonal register uh, yeah. as, as I'm seeking um, this other lost language. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so the so when I so I actually don't like to read uh, tones of the Vietnamese language because I'm I'm not always confident in my um, speaking uh, the tones. Uh, when I and this is one of also one of the older poems um, that I first wrote. This is an, actually really another list poem if you mm -hmm. think about it. Yeah, okay. Because uh, it's listing. List, do you want me to read it anyway? I would love that. Yes, okay. I would totally I'll love that. Give you, give you my try. Tones in the Vietnamese language. Ma. Level. Ghost. Ma. High rising. Mother. Ma low falling, but ma, low constricted, rice seedling, ma, dipping rising, horse, ma, low dipping, tomb. Yeah, it's so great. Like just the, um the body as a receptor and the the subtlety and the nuance of of language i think people don't you don't quite realize you know and and what i love about this book is that there's so much in which you're inviting us to to pay attention and to notice those nuances so that's um it's really beautiful um so we are kind of winding out of time here. I have so many more questions, but um, I was actually, another favorite poem was um, Sing Ding Ghostly. And um, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to read that poem and maybe talk briefly about it. And then I have one final question for you. Okay. 
Um, I would love to, to read Sing Ding Ghostly. Um, it's just reminding me of like being a DJ and be like taking requests. <laughs> yes. Um, I was a DJ in college that, at the University of Maryland. Uh -huh. Um, WMUC, I had um, a coveted evening show. Oh, that's great. It was amazing. It was in also the heyday of college radio, so it was, it was very hot. Um, so in the book there, um, so not only am I like speaking to this diasporic Vietnamese experiences, um, sort of this biography of my, my mother's um, life in Vietnam, young adult life in Vietnam, and then post-migration. Um, there are several ghosts that that sort of materialize through the text. Mm -hmm. Also, there's which like language participates in is like a language ghost. There's, um, a, you know, sibling ghosts, children that my mother had before myself, including a daughter who um, actually she had given my name to first or really given mm -hmm. her name to and then gave her name to me uh, when I was born. She had died when she was two. So that's, that's a ghost inside this one. Sing ding, ghostly. Where is she buried? The first Hua gone to ground, buried in Mekong mud and unknown years drowned in lung matter. The first Hua had not medicine, I got it, the medicine and got the golden visa and the ash hair and breathings, lashings to a raft life, lashed to life, the blonde joke of pull eyes. Mother swims from the nest, pushes sand first, scrapes flat flipper feet. We come from egg and make it are the lived loved thing, cracked leather egg from dragon fairy mating left warm in warm sand. She buried the nest us as nest so we could unbury gulp sand few kin in the sand we seek under beached beach moon beach the moon water beach this isn't doing anything like redemption do dad mountain dragon unsuffering did slithers to seaways who are you to talk tits and me shame sing ding dong songs at me boys i called it unsufferable said I'll meet her in heaven where the perfume is. I say, I'll meet you there, Hua. Uh, I just love that. So beautifully read. And I mean, there's the music. You, we began this conversation with you talking about music and the influence of music. And uh, wow, has it ever just infused your, your poetry and your being. So I just loved hearing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have one last question um, before we close here, and that is really what creative community looks like for you at this stage. Um, because there's one kind of community we have when we're younger, you know, when we're at new college and we're creating zine, da, 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 da. but what does it look like for you now as, a, as an established poet? Um, it just really means older. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, uh, you know, we have our we have our sort of ways and places where we we uh, remain in place because of um, families and jobs and things like that, and that sort of you know becomes a way to that um, reflects uh, you know the the, the um, participants of our immediate community. So here in Toronto, uh, where I've been based now since 2011, um, you know, I have. Um, people who have come to be part of my community as part of, of, of workshops that I lead on uh, creative writing, um, reading-based generative creative writing workshops that I've been doing, actually started in Austin um, and um, carried on when I moved here, um, are doing them on Zoom, trying to figure out, you know, what the next sort of uh, iteration is going to look like um, as we sort of reconsider everything. Um, but the participants of that of those workshops, you know, sort of create a, a, a local uh, layer of um, participants in the conversation. Um, and then, you know, the the people that you meet across time, you know, luckily, hopefully, you know, if you're lucky, you get to you get to to, to remain close along the way. So, so the um, community actually becomes like richer and um, 
you know, then you, you know, you add like younger generations as you, as you go, right? Uh, that, that is important to me too, right? That, that my conversation remains like refresh, you know, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm paying a kind of respect to sort of people that came before me, which also means like reading and making sure that my reading stays refreshed, which mm -hmm. I think is a big part of participating in community. It's a part of, um, you know, understanding and support, you know, um, of makers. Like we can't just be making stuff. Like we also have to do those other, you know, um, w w ways to support through curational, you know, gestures through like what you're doing, where you're, you know, bringing people together in consideration of art making. You know, that's what I do when I teach as well, and, yeah. and that's been a site of community making for me as well. And um, I've been lucky to teach um, at, at Bard MFA uh, for the last while. I'm looking forward to to our 22 program, and that always brings me in contact with with makers from across disciplines, which is and um, from from many places, and that's always very enriching in the student yeah. work. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, while when this has been just a fascinating and beautiful conversation, thank you so, so much for taking the time to be here. And again, the book, the latest book is A Thousand Times You Lose Your Treasure. And it is a treasure at, oh, awesome. <laughs> sure, I don't have my physical copy yet. So, um, but it's uh, published by Wave Books. And you can get it at uh, is it wavebooks.com, I think. I think so. Something like that. You can you can Google it. But um, again, people, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, remember to um, post your comments below, like this video, uh, subscribe to the to our little YouTube channel here. And uh, till next time, live well, love well, and write well. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.